yeah, the LA Rams stink. So what did we actually learn about the Packers in their Monday night win? Lily Zhao from Fox 6 in Milwaukee joins us to discuss that and a lot more on another Zhao You Doing. Let's go. You are locked on Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how as I mentioned, Lily Zhao on the show today. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. And today's episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Football GM. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com and look it up in the App Store, ultimate-gm.com, and you can get free boosts with the promo code Locked On. All right, I, I went... I wanted to go long with with Lily because this is a weird week, Monday night game. So we we didn't have a lot of time to digest a lot of of what we normally get to digest. But when we had this conversation, hadn't even had a chance to look at the All-22 yet. So we we want to dive into a lot of that. We look forward a little bit to Miami and and what's going on there. We talk about Signal Gate <laughs> and a lot of that stuff. That's all coming up. Just briefly, I want to reiterate something that I talked about yesterday during the game. It is time to just let Devontae Wyatt play through it. And I understand I'm not there every day. I'm not seeing the work he is or isn't putting in. And when when Joe Barry was asked about why Devontae Wyatt wasn't playing more because it's one of those funny things. Our pal Jake Morley every week tweets out the, the pro football focus grades and he tweets out the highest graded players on both sides of the ball. And Devontae Wyatt is inevitably one of the highest graded defenders. But he, but then you look at the snap counts and you go, okay, he played seven snaps. He played nine snaps. He played nine snaps in this game. And you're going, why is that? And when you watch the tape, it backs it up. In this game, he played nine snaps. He had a tackle for loss and half a sack. And, and won immediately both of those reps. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I understand from a coaching perspective, you want a guy who's putting in the work and who's studying and who's practicing well and all of that stuff. And a guy you can't trust to be in the right spot is not a guy who really can be playing with any sort of regularity. But... The rest of this defensive line group outside of Kenny Clark is just not good. And the guy who every time he's on the field makes some plays is Devontae Wyatt. And so at a certain point, you just have to say the talent, the ability, it wins. And if you let him make mistakes on the field, then you can correct them. Let him play through the mistakes. Let him figure it out. And and you know what? Let him get embarrassed a couple times. Because you know what? Dean Lowry already getting embarrassed just being on the field. TJ Slayton, Jerron Reed, some of these other guys who are out there, they just don't impact the game. He impacts the game every time he's out there. And for me, I'm, I want to live with variance in a situation like this. If he's going to make a couple tackles for loss, if he's going to make these impact plays, if he's going to create pressure, I'll live with him being out of position on a run fit here and there. I'll live with him shooting a gap when he shouldn't here and there if it means he's going to make these impactful plays. And then in the meeting rooms, you can go over and say, hey, Devontae, here's why don't do that. I understand the impulse and it's easy for me to sit here and say, I understand that part of it too. But 
when you watch what happens on the field, he's just so clearly more talented than these other guys. And and at a certain point, when those other guys, it it'd be, it would be different, right? It would be different if. These other guys were like the Alan Lazards of the offense. Like Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson have proven to be more dynamic football players than Alan Lazard. But Alan Lazard is an incredibly valuable player to the Green Bay Packers. First of all, incredibly reliable. He's a first down machine. Incredible blocker. Can play inside, outside. Red zone threat. Big play threat. Jump ball. Like he's a he's a legit starting NFL receiver. I don't think Dean Lowry is a legit starting NFL defensive lineman. I don't think TJ Slayton right now is a legit starting defensive lineman. And Jerron Reed is is borderline. So it would not be like you're taking this awesome guy, or not even awesome, this solid, good player off the field to put on your very talented young rookie. You're, You're taking guys who are probably not going to be on this team next year off the field. Guys who don't consistently make any kind of impact positively on this defense. I don't understand it. And 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 part of that is because I don't have the information. I don't have the negative stuff. The stuff that's keeping him from being on the field. We don't know what that is. He could be, I don't even want to speculate. But there are myriad reasons that a player who is talented is not seeing the field. What's interesting is we're also not really seeing the big mistakes. So maybe he's making mistakes in practice. Maybe on the on the whiteboard, he doesn't know always where to be. But on the field, it's not like he's giving up gaps or he's he's getting too far upfield and letting big runs happen behind him. Like that stuff's just not happening. So I don't know what's happening behind the scenes that that's preventing him from getting on the field. It would I think it would benefit their team if he played more. That's the TLDR. All right, we're gonna get to Lily. But before we do, today's episode brought to you by our friends at the Ultimate Football GM, a new partner of ours. I'm really excited about this. This is a really cool thing that especially for fans of this show in particular and the way that that we do things here, this is a great opportunity to put all of your football knowledge to use. It's not just like other video games where you're just like, oh, play. eh." No, this is the nitty gritty. This is coaching staffs. This is scouting departments. This is revenue to pay players. This is figuring out contracts. This is being a GM. Everyone thinks that they can be a GM. It's not managing a fantasy football team. So put your skills to the test. We've been, we've been playing it. The lockdown NFL hosts have been playing it. It is a blast. Locked on Packers listeners can get a 100% free boost for their franchise. When you use the promo code locked on in the game store, that's locked on. So make sure to check it out today. Download the game ultimate dash GM.com or look it up in the app store ultimate-gm.com the ultimate football gm start your dynasty today this episode is brought to you by audible audible is releasing a new slate of football podcasts that you're sure to love that's why you'll be able to find an episode of the league available as a bonus episode on locked on nfl narrated by super bowl champion and legendary Smack talker Richard Sherman and news broadcaster and rising star Taylor Rooks. The League is an eight-part docuseries about the bizarre, inspirational, and unlikely stories connected to America's favorite sport, pro football. You don't want to miss these untold stories spanning from the 1940s through the present. Our bonus episode is called The Way of the Cowboy and is the incredible story of how the 1977 Dallas Cowboys brought in Bruce Lee's protege to teach their defense martial arts, ushering in a new approach to the way the league trained. Each story offers equal parts history, entertainment, and social commentary. Head over to the Locked On NFL for a bonus episode of The League or catch the full series wherever you get your podcasts available now. Audible. Get in the game. And thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Locked On Sports today. The biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reaction, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. It's my show, Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. Not used to doing this right after a game, a a Zhao you do an edition that really can be sort of a, a post game show. Our first opportunity with a little bit of distance after the Packers take care of the Rams 24 to 12 to keep their playoff hopes alive. Our last one before the Christmas holiday, of course, happy Hanukkah to those who, who uh, um, participate in that as well. Merry Christmas. Happy new year. All that good stuff. Lily, Zhao you doing? 
Peter, doing well. Uh, it's it's the, it's Festivus. Everyone's happy, happy. Yes. Are winning. It's the holiday season, like you mentioned. Christmas is coming. Happy holidays to everybody, and and it's going to be a great week. So I'm doing well. How you doing? I'm good. Um, we will not be airing any grievances um, today. Um, and so, well, we might air some, honestly. Um, certainly, that's what Twitter has been for for a long time now for a lot of sports fans. Um, so I, I saw something interesting happen among some fans after the game. And, and I was talking about the defense and how statistically, if you look at the game, the Packers just like demolished the Rams. But it didn't always feel like that during the game. Um, and so after the game, you have fans going, well, it's the Rams. They stink. And I go, okay, I agree. They stink, but a, a decent defense should dominate. And they did. That's good. We should acknowledge that. How do you, how do you find a way to sort of balance the, the, okay, the Rams are bad, but also the Packers played well on the defensive side. It, it's a delicate balance, right? Because when, when you kind of evaluate wins, it's, you know, have this been, you beat the, the bills as a different narrative versus you beat say the Colts, you know, yes, the Rams are not a very good team, but their defense is still, they still have playmakers and, you know, Aaron Donald didn't play. That was a big factor as to why the Packers were able to, I think, move the football pretty efficiently. But again, I think Aaron Rodgers has addressed this as well. Yeah. You know, they beat some bad teams, but at the end of the day, a win's a win and they've needed to stack up some wins and they've been able to do that. So while the metrics of it might not look as good as say a win over a playoff contending, really good team, you know, this is still a win for a team that desperately needed them. I mean, at this point of the season, we are talking about this team just needs wins and they were able to do it. And, you know, despite the fact that it was a lower scoring game that I think the, when you look at the stats and it probably should have been, at least they got the win. So I'm like, yeah, it was against the Rams and they got eliminated out of the playoffs, but whatever. W's a W. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's, that, it, it, I think you have to be able to say it's good to play well, regardless of who it is against. And I kept trying to make this point on the post game show. Like, look, it's hard to win in the NFL. The Rams just beat a team in the AFC. That's trying to make the playoffs. That has a chance to make the playoffs. So we can't just say, oh, well, it's the Rams. Well, the, the Rams have won some games this year as bad as they've been. So it can't just be dismissed out of hand. I have to ask you before we get much further into this, and I want to talk about the offense and and what we saw. What was your take on Signal Gate? <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think it was ever amplified as much until this week for you know obvious reasons yeah. when it came out. Um, and it was it was interesting in the broadcast where they pointed out the one hand signal that Rodgers made to Christian Watson, who didn't see it or or maybe didn't understand what it was, and there was miscommunication, yada yada yada. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I do think the article gave a really good insight on 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 the offense and how things operate, but I don't think you know the end all be all was was you know should be bigger. It should be made bigger on on this hand signal thing. So I don't. I, I, you know, Rogers has made his comments on the article, whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was a crazy revelation, um, but I think it was just made bigger this week because of that. Because it, they always have hand signals. It's not like this is a new concept. So I think it just was made bigger and brought to light because of sort of things. You know what? You know what I think happened here. I think everything with Rogers now has become a Rorschach test, <laughs> where whatever you feel about him you're going to extract something. So if you're the kind of person that, that feels obligated to defend everything that he does, you're going to look at this and you say, this is another Roger Rogers hit piece and they're criticizing him. I didn't read it that way. Um, and, and on the other side, you might be the kind of person going, well, see this shows Aaron Rodgers. Um, this is why this is always a problem. This is his fault. I also didn't read it that way. I, I thought, as you said, it was just really good insight into the process. Like I wondered, how they taught those things. I, I wondered about it. And this actually dovetails really well into something that they said during the broadcast that I want to ask you about. Because they were talking about Aaron Rodgers and Romeo Dobbs and Christian Watson sitting together and watching the tape. A specific dedicated time to go over the tape. What were you thinking on this? What were you thinking on this? And the inference was that at some point, they weren't doing that. That seems bad. You know, I think we artists all sort of assumed they were doing that. And I think it's sort of like the hand signal thing where it's like, well, we assumed they were teaching the receivers what these hand signals were. Well, it turns out they weren't. They were just having to figure it out on the fly. Well, those things just seem suboptimal in terms of the coaching of all of this. What did you think of, of that anecdote? And, and 
why, why did it take this long for them to start doing that? This just seems crazy to me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. And, and, you know, there's always three sides to everything. So, you know, I, Rogers, you know, of course, had his opinion on it and said 95% of it was false, but that's his opinion. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly, again, with how I read it and kind of just how you were able to narrate it, it was, it did seem very much so like it was a new thing, which is kind of perplexing considering, again, you have rookie receivers, you know, Rogers has had, had hand signals and, and guys like Rhino Cobb, the veterans know him. They've known him for a long time. But again, when you have rookies who, again, these guys are coming in injured, they're not playing consistently because of health. It's they're not going to be on the field consistently with Rogers. And we saw some miscommun miscommunication. So you were kind of wondering, perhaps had this been done earlier, maybe that could have been put to the side and they would have been more consistent. Um, but yes, it, it certainly did read as this was something that they were just kind of recently doing, which is again, a little perplexing for a team that, you know, you want to believe that they're giving it their all, not saying that they're not, but that they're going 150% trying to win these games and trying to find ways to, to get these guys to play at their optimal strength. So. Yeah. I, I just, it seems like you would think that they would have been meeting all along doing everything they can. And part of it, right, is that Romeo Dobbs wasn't out there for a stretch for over a month and Christian Watson wasn't out there for a month. And so you can't like, what are you just going to meet with Romeo like that? You just don't really have time to do that. Now that these guys are back in a big part of the offense, it seems like it makes a lot more sense to be doing that. What did you think of our first glimpse of these two guys with them both on the field now that they've each had an opportunity to really shoulder the number one receiver responsibilities in this offense? Oh, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> it, it's fun because again, it's been such a very limited sample size because of injury that we haven't been able to see these guys on the field at the same time. Finally got it. And, you know, Aaron Rodgers even said, you know, Romeo Dobbs is such a crisp route runner. Christian Watson is just so explosive. They add different things to this offense. And it was just so refreshing to see. I know Romeo Dobbs has had a very up and down season in terms of drops and then he makes some great catches, but I thought he played very well for, you know, his first time back in a couple of weeks yeah. and getting him really integrated in the offense was kind of what we were seeing unfold against the Rams and Christian Watson, even though he wasn't making, you know, a bunch of catches was still having an impact. You know, he's blocking up front. He was stretching the field. He was able to, you know, draw a couple penalties. And, um, you know, I think the impact, whether it's making catches or doing the other intangibles has been really big for these guys. So I like it. I think it's going to be a really fun duo and I'm excited to see what they can do on Christmas day. It, it is going to be interesting because the dolphins love to blitz and Aaron Rodgers was excellent against the Rams. When they brought pressure, they had to bring pressure because no Aaron Donald and the offensive line, they were not, it was not their best effort. You know, in some ways that's to be expected coming off the long layoff. It takes a little while to get back in the groove. Yash Nyman in particular, I thought, struggled in this game in pass protection. But the Rams said, we dare you to run the ball against us. And the Packers did. And they put almost 140 yards on the ground. So that's that's how you want to beat these teams if they're going to play that way. I'm just, I'm really interested to see what the Dolphins are going to do. Um, I, I thought the Dolphins answered a lot of questions last week. Um, in that in that game against the Bills that that really by all right they probably should have won that they really gave it away at the end um what, what just from the the limited amount that that we have seen from them this season I don't know if you've been watching every Miami Dolphins game I certainly have not um what kind of uh challenge do you think they present this week for Green Bay Oh man, it is going to be, I know it's like when you're looking at the schedule, you're kind of thinking, okay, can they win out? Right. I, I think again, the litmus test has to be the dolphins. I mean, this is a playoff contending team Tua, as you mentioned, has been playing well. Tyreek Hill is going to be a matchup nightmare because it feels like every time you go into a game where there's a premier receiver or a premier guy to contain, it doesn't really happen on the defensive side of the football. So it's don't let Tyreek Hill just run wild because then it's a bad day for green Bay. Um, I think it's going to be a really fun matchup. Again, the Packers and don't... they have two guys like that. Jalen Waddle can also Correct. fly, fly. Yes. Um, Packers traditionally don't play well in Florida, which is a bummer. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not going to be terribly hot, so... Which is weird, right? Wisconsinites love Florida. Like, yeah. they're like half of Florida is just expat Wisconsin people. Yeah, they just travel south. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's an explosive offense. So, I think I'm curious to see, though... Can this Packers defense get into Tua's head? Can they try to contain him? I mean, he's a really, really good quarterback. He's got so many weapons, especially on the outside. So 
can they contain him? Because I, I really do think this is going to come down to can the Packers defense make the stops that they need to because we saw a couple of third longs against the Rams that were just kind of give me first downs. So can they play closer to the line? Can they challenge these receivers? Can they get to Tua? Interesting to see that because I do think that the offense, you know, you mentioned how much this defense blitzes, the Dolphins defense. I think the offense will still be able to turn out some points, but it's can the defense keep pace and play complimentary football? Best Christmas present you've ever gotten? Great segue. Oh, that's a good question. I will say, though, it was a while ago, but I, my parents did get me uh, tickets for a trip. So that was very nice of them. Uh, but it was. Where was the trip? Well, OK, don't judge me, guys. Uh, so we from Florida, not from Florida, but we lived in Florida for a while. Um, and so we my parents got me like tickets to Disney when I was like, what, like high school or something. But I had been, you know, wanting to go for a while because we went when I was a bunch as a kid and I hadn't gone for like a decade. So they got me tickets for Christmas one year. So that was really nice. Why would people judge you for that? Everyone loves Disney. Know, they're like a Disney nerd. I'm not a Disney nerd, but I do enjoy a Disney. Listen, if and you I, want to be a Disney nerd, you can be a Disney nerd. I, look, I, listen, do what well, makes you happy if it's not hurting anybody else. And Disney nerddom is not hurting anybody else. I promise. Yeah. I, we, I've been one time Disney World. It's fun. I loved it's, it. It was great. Right. Um, I don't yeah. need to go back 16 times. Some people do. That's fine. Like yeah. it's the problem is it's expensive. It's expensive, which is why I didn't want to pay. But my thing is this, it's like, as we get older, it's, you can kind of buy whatever you want for yourself. Right. So it's hard for me like now to say, oh, I got this great present. Um, but what did you get, Peter? What's your best present? Besides oh man. Your, besides your son, of course. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I think, um, there have been some really good Christmases. So a couple years ago, um, my family, I was living in New York City. My family came. We went to, I don't go to, I haven't been to that many games as a fan since I started doing this. And so we went to Packers Jets in 2018. And as a family, my my sister came in and, and her wife and, um, you know, my wife and my my parents came and we went to the game. We went back to my parents' hotel. We had... Um, our, our Christmas, we opened presents, we ordered Indian food. We had a lot of wine. Love um, it. and it was just really great. So it wasn't a present per se, but it was like an experience an experience. Yeah. And to have my family come, um, and, and, you know, you have the Packer game and all that stuff. It was just, that's, what's jumping to my mind. I'm sure I can think of some like, you know, um, things back in the day. Someone asked me my worst Christmas, like, what was my worst Christmas present? Um, I didn't have a good answer for that. Do you have a good answer for that? No. Cause I'm like, listen, I like gifts. So I'll like anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I got something that's fine. Like, yeah. I will say like my dad's a terrible gift giver. Um, so he'll, he'll like wrap probably like a bottle of wine that's, you know, in our fridge and be like, Merry Christmas. Or he'll, I don't know. He'll give me like some apples or something and say Merry Christmas. So maybe that. Yeah. That might be a dad thing. Not, you know, there's a lot, a lot of dads that are not. Are not uh, not great at that. I think specific instructions help. I have found that a list a list is a is a wonderful thing. I used to be kind of anti gift lists, but no, you're you're going to get me something. We know you're going to get me something. It's not you know it's not a secret. So let's just have a conversation about things that you really want. I think that's fine. Yeah. Uh, segueing this back to the Packers for a second, <laughs> if you could give the Packers one gift, what would you give them? Hmm. If I can give them a gift. So it's something I have to give the team. Not not like, I, I mean, sort of like esoterically, like, okay, yeah. like Christian Watson plays really well or like something like that where it's like, okay, Quay Walker takes a big step forward or okay. um, the weather is 45 degrees on, on Sunday for the Dolphins, like something like that. Um, I would say give me a Keyshawn Nixon touchdown of any kind. I don't care if it's- I love it. I want that. Give me that. I so, absolutely love it. I that is a great one. And that could be right. Those are the kinds of things. If you're trying to beat a team that has at least over the course of the season been better than you, you need those kinds of things. Like that's what you need. Keyshawn Nixon. Let's talk about him for a second, Lily. I'm so glad you brought him up because I wanted to ask you about him. How, how was Amari Rogers playing for as long as he was? Oh, you know, I, I Amari's a great kid. I, I think he's hopefully going to find his footing in Houston. I do too. Um, it just, I think it was Rich Passaccia, really, really loved him, thought he had potential, just held out a little bit too long. And unfortunately, that could have been the time where Keyshawn was able to, to step in and, and shine. And 
you know, Rogers even mentioned it, you know, had we had him in earlier, we don't, you know, who knows where this team would be, but I think it just was a belief um, in Amari that he would eventually just figure it out and turn things around and, and be a great returner, but it just never happened. But, you know, fortunately they have Keyshawn Nixon and uh, he's gotten very, very, very glowing reviews, rightfully so. But uh, I, I just think that it was just unfortunate uh, Amari didn't work out there. So it's interesting because special teams, especially they don't practice that much. So, and, and it's hard to go full tilt in practice on special teams. You really only do that for training camp. There's, a, there's some special teams, pro, you know, portions of practice during the week. So I believe Matt LaFleur, when he said we, we didn't know what we had in Keyshawn Nixon, because you just, unless he's doing it, you don't know. Here's the interesting thing. LaFleur said this on, uh, on, on Tuesday during his media availability. Apparently Keyshawn Nixon is uh, trying to get Matt LaFleur to put him in on offense and play the slot. And at first I was like, that's silly. And then I was like, wait, doing that. Like Tyler Irvin was brought in as a punt returner was great. And then they, they let him the next year in 2020 jet motion and doing some stuff like that. Like, why not? Like if he's a playmaker, give him an opportunity. I think this, I think this is a fun idea. What do you think? Yeah, listen, if, if that happens, he'll have played defense, special teams, and offense. I mean, he'll have played everything. Um, the Deion Sanders. Right. I'm like, why not? I mean, if this is a guy who's made an impact who, you know, can touch the football and jet it up for 20, 30 yards, why not give him a shot? Because, again, even if it doesn't work, at least you've tried it. And you're like, hey, there's a fun new wrinkle we could add to the offense. But I don't think there's any harm in, in giving him that that option, that package, per se, if, if they let him on the offense. But I think it'd be fun. I mean – Listen, this this offense, this team hasn't had a lot of electricity this season, and I think Keyshawn's provided it. So, hey, put him in there. I'd be an advocate for that. Okay, I'm going to ask you an impossible question. Now that now that we've seen this team again, they beat the Rams. We've seen what's gone on in the rest of the NFC, the state of the NFC, and we've seen that now it's probably pretty likely that if the Packers do make the playoffs as the seven seed, they're probably going to have to play the 49ers. So, <laughs> long term. What is the best outcome for the Packers this season in terms of how the rest of this plays out? If we're just going to take like the Super Bowl off the table, like just give me the next three weeks. What is the best thing that will set them up for the most success moving forward? I, I by the way, do not think there is an easy answer to this question. That's a very, very tough question because there's a lot of things I could I could say. Um Again, then making the Super Bowl, longest shot, long shot, long shot. Yeah. Making the playoffs, still possible. Possible. But again, Dolphins, Vikings, Lions. I mean, that's that's a tough slate. It's, tough. it's a tough slate. So, you know, say they squeak into the playoffs, they play the Niners. We know how that traditionally has worked out. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, and we're hoping, man, we're hoping not for an, for an early exit, but whatever. Um, I would say, and this is a very boring answer of me, mm. but I would say progression from rookies in this draft class. I think it would be very fun to see, you know, the Quays, the, you know, Christians, the Romeos, the Zachs, these guys continue to improve, be a reason for Aaron Rodgers to come back next year. Uh, be a future foundation piece for this team and moving forward. Because again, this team is talented. It just took a while for them to figure things out. And a while, I mean like the entire season, but <laughs> <laughs> there are still some good foundational pieces on this team because again, the odds of them kind of making the playoffs and making a dent in the postseason are very slim. So what else is there, right? Progress with your rookies, I think would be a really fun one to see. I think obviously it would be great to have them win out. And I, I think like last night is a great example. Um, this is a game where they did not have to give the kind of effort that they did to see AJ Dillon get pushed into the off or the, the, the end zone by his offensive line to see them making these plays on special teams. Like they did not have to play this hard and, and they did. And I think that's a credit to Matt LaFleur. That's a credit to their culture. And I think to me, that's the most important thing that I have my eye on moving forward. Keep trying to win all of these games because this team is talented enough next year. They've got, they've got, you know, all their draft picks, um, some flexibility with to, to be able to bring some of these guys back. Like they can be a good team next year. It just took them a little while to, to get everything in rhythm. They had some, th some dumb injuries. I, I kind of think there's no bad outcomes for them except losing out. Cause that would just feel really bad. But even then you're getting a, a, a good pick. I think they've redeemed the season in a lot of ways. 
And now it's just like, you can find the good in all of it. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm being Pollyanna about it, but I, I don't, I don't think I am. It's your, it's your, it's the holiday season. You're feeling, feeling you're right. And I'm happy. drinking that. I'm drinking that eggnog. You know, it's, it's tasty. Eggnog is kind of gross. Um, do you like eggnog? No, that was, that was a very quick no. Sorry. Yeah, not, I mean, it's, it's just too, it's too much. Like I like, there are a lot of holiday cocktails I like, and I love to try new ones. I'm going to, there's one that, that we're going to try here with my family. That's like a mixture of an Aperol spritz, a mimosa and a uh, French 75. Oh, so it's that's like nice gin, champagne, yeah. orange juice, and Aperol, which sounds really, really good. Um, and I, but yes, you know, eggnog is not for me. I, don't no, like that. Me I do like an Irish hot cocoa though. The hot chocolate with the whiskey. That yeah, is pretty good. That's primo stuff. Um, okay, Lily, we uh, will be talking to you next week after um, the holiday season doesn't quite come to a close, but we'll have Christmas and then, but then we'll get to talk about new years and, and a lot more stuff coming up. Um, I appreciate you joining me and we will talk again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Thanks to Lily for joining the show. Great to talk to her. I hope her, her feet and fingers have thawed out after being at the game on Monday night and, and what was very cold temperatures. This holiday, find what you love at Total Wine and more with so many great bottles to choose from. It's easy to find a new favorite single barrel bourbon, I found one recently, or the perfect gifts for everyone on your list, no free ads, with some help from a friendly guide and all with the confidence of knowing you found something special for the lowest price. Love what you find. Only a Total Wine and more. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly. B21. And thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today. I bring you, me, this guy, Peter Bukowski brings you the biggest stories from around the sports world in 20 minutes. It's weird to see your name and have to read it uh, in a promo. Get the analysis and opinion before anyone else with our local and national experts and insiders locked on sports today, available on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. All right, back tomorrow, crossover Thursday. Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins joins us. And I'm working on scheduling an interview for Friday. Not going to do a live show. We will be, we will be live on Christmas. We will be live on Christmas. So if the Packers win, great, awesome. Um, that'll be your Christmas present. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, so you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live, like this Sunday night, check us out on the Locked on Packers YouTube page to stay Locked on Packers.